Hi, my name is Vaith Triath, and I'm the director of the NASA Laboratory for Advanced Sensing. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, you just heard from Anna and Heidi about some of the new technologies that are being applied to ocean worlds uh, and some of the discoveries they're enabling to make. I'm going to share some more. Uh, my talk of, the title of my talk is Next Generation Sensing Technologies for Exploring Oceans Across the Solar System. I just want to give a shout out to my team pictured here on one of our field campaigns in Guam. Um, it's all a collective effort. It's a very large group working on each of these technologies and instruments. And uh, I'm just delighted I get to help represent uh, my lab here. So why I, I do this, you know, and, and what, why we have so much left to do. Um, I used to be in astrophysics and I moved over to earth science. Uh, what about a decade ago? And this still remains true. We have mapped more of the surface of Mars, the sun, and the moon than we have of our own ocean floor. We're at about 8% now of mapping our ocean floor at a similar resolution to what we have on these celestial bodies. And one of the reasons why it's just very difficult to sense <laughs> the ocean. So my lab has really been focused on um, three different instrument developments, two different instrument developments, uh, fluid cam and MIDAR, as well as an AI technology that uses dat data from both of these instruments uh, to come up with uh, results that are you know, pertinent to earth science. Uh, but these all have a focus you know, on, on our own ocean and then extending the technologies for um, oceans across our solar system. So one of the challenges we have, uh, which you've heard about already with sensing the ocean is just with electromagnetic radiation, not much light gets through our atmosphere um, from the sun. You can see at the top left here what the atmospheric opacity looks like. There's a great um, gap in the radio bands, which would be useful to use, except in water, all of those radio bands are attenuated. Um, in fact, most of the thermal infrared bands are also attenuated. So you're left with really just this small narrow section in the visible bands from about 380 to 720 nanometers where light penetrates down to a depth of about 100 meters or so. So the first challenge is just there's not much light to work with in the ocean. The second is uh, refraction. So, you know, the ocean exists under an atmosphere of air and there's a two fluid um, meeting there which causes an index of refraction jump. The result is that light gets bent significantly going uh, even through a flat surface in the ocean. And it makes it very difficult for satellites and for aircraft, um, even in a flat ocean state, to reliably image a target at depth um, in the same location. So to geolocate that, you know, depending on the satellite or aircraft view axis, the location of that object can appear to move when in reality it's, it might be stationary, sessile, like a coral. Um, when you add ocean waves into that mix, you get an um, effect that causes um, significant degradation in effective spatial resolution. And this can be quite significant depending on the sea state. For most systems, it limits the resolution to about 50 centimeters or, or, um, or worse. And you know, it, it is really difficult to study how a system is changing over time if you cannot generate an accurate picture of that uh, through this ocean wave distortion regime. So the first instrument uh, that my lab is focused on is, is tackling that problem of refraction and attenuation. This is called FluidCam, built into a CubeSat platform. Fluid lensing um, and FluidCam essentially work by taking very high resolution multispectral videos of a target. So if you look at a coral target, this is um, from a pool at a, a brain coral test target at a depth of four and a half meters. You can see in the no fluid case in the top left, that would be the ideal. If we were to drain the ocean, that would be what we would see from an aircraft or a satellite. If you added a flat fluid um, case, so a completely flat ocean, you could see the bottom left, you see it's, it's attenuated, but you don't have the refractive distortions. When you introduce ocean waves, you get very strong refractive distortions, as well as these bright bands of light called caustics that dance over the target. And those can really wreak havoc with an instrument because they can be very bright, brighter than um, some of the specular glare coming off the surface. And right now what our instruments are doing is they take a picture that may be one one hundredth or one tenth of a second and they basically create the image in the bottom middle. It, it, all those refractions blur together and you get a degradation in um, effective spatial resolution. If you have a high frame rate sensor, you can see the top middle picture. So you can see this instantaneous distortion, but you can't actually correct the geometry. So fluid lensing is able to, um, from that multispectral video, determine the wave dynamics, and then use that to back out the refractive corrections to create the top right video. Um, and then caustics are tracked, those bright bands of light, to create the bottom right picture. And um, on the bottom row, all of those images were captured during the same time, but you'll notice the fluid lensing integration has higher spatial resolution as well as um, signal to noise ratio. 
So we've been flying this around uh, different coral reefs in the world. This is on a, a drone platform in American Samoa, looking at a fringing reef we've revisited a number of times. Here you can see what some of the raw data from the instrument look like. So in addition to the refractive distortions, uh, you have reflection, right? Specular glare in the camera. And this is the fluid lensing view of that same target. So right now, uh, to our knowledge, this is the highest resolution view from an airborne platform uh, or anything above the surface of something underwater. Uh, this has been validated to about three millimeter resolution in 3D. And it really gives a diver scale view of that reef environment. Uh, you can actually see a sea cucumber pop up uh, in the bottom right over there. That's roughly about six inches or so in size for comparison. Um, recently, fluid lensing has been advanced a bit further. We've been able to get to a depth of 45 feet reliably. Um, this was from a field campaign in Guam uh, just uh, recently. And we'll be going back there again this fall to try to push that to 60 feet depth or so. Uh, the caustics you can see in the left and right before and after fluid lensing, um, the caustics get removed, but they actually can be much brighter than the downwelling irradiance um, at the surface of, of the water, you know, at a depth, a significant depth. And that's coming from the focusing of sunlight. So that's allowing us to, to sort of beat the attenuation and get deeper in the column. Uh, comparis, comparing uh, some of these new results to the state of the art, you can see the best satellite picture of um, something called peak bomb holes in Guam on the left and the fluid lensing um, uh, 2D image as well as 3D uh, bathymetry model there. And that's compared to the best LIDAR bathysonar data set on the far right uh, from that same region Again, this is in, in Guam and shows kind of the resolution of, of this instrument capability. Uh, the new fluid lensing is also able to separate out finally um, things that are stratified in the water column that are moving, that are usually organisms. So things like sharks, uh, schools of fish, we've been able to, we can't directly image them because they still have distortions, but we can look at a, a corrected difference map. And that allows us to pick out all of the objects that we're moving and track and count the number of sharks and parrotfish. This is still very experimental, so we're going to try to deploy this on our next campaign to get an account of biomass in addition to mapping the benthic surface uh, for a given area. Um, here are some of the locations we've done field campaigns uh, with this instrument and some of the upcoming locations we'll be doing field campaigns. And we've also been testing fluid cam on ultra long endurance uh, UAS. This is a great new technology that would uh, enable us to do persistent marine mapping of these ecosystems, which is very difficult from orbit and very difficult from ground-based aircraft because they're usually quite remote. So the idea of having you know, solar electric uh, drones like this one, uh, flying payloads persistently for months at a time over islands is, is really um, exciting for marine science and being able to map these systems. This is from the successful test flight with that instrument um, out in the desert last summer. So fluid cam gets you to that top, you know, maybe 90 feet max um, of the water ocean column. But unfortunately, the average depth is about four kilometers and there's significantly more that needs to be mapped in our ocean volume. And for that, we've been developing uh, another follow on instrument called MIDAR. This is a multispectral imaging detection and active reflectance instrument. And the idea here is that you bring the light source with you. Um, you bring a structured optical illuminator um, that works with something like fluid cam, a computational imager. So a transmitter emits narrow band electromagnetic radiation onto a target. The receiver can record that um, uh, reflectance in a panchromatic channel. So it doesn't actually have a color sensor. It has a, a black and white sensor. But from that, it can then uh, resolve what the multispectral reflectance can be. So we fly this on, on drones right now for uh, multispectral mapping. You can see a video of the drone here in Guam with the MIDAR transmission slowed down so you can visualize the frequencies um, and the receiver on the other end there. And there are spectral bands that span everything from you know, the far UV um, to the near infrared. And we can tune these you know, depending on what kind of emitter chemistries exist. So fortunately, there's been a lot of development in LED and laser diode technologies that have enabled very high optical efficiencies approaching 30 to 40% electrical efficiency. So a lot of power can go directly into illuminating a target. Um, this is what the instrument looks like flying at night um, over a coral reef environment. Here you can see some of the spectral bands it's cycling through. And these are some of the data sets it produces. So we're able to, from above the ocean surface at nighttime, you know, image something at depth. This is a parietes coral on the left. And also while we're imaging it, we can uh, send data streams through the surface, um, the moving refractive surface. So here we've transmitted the name of the lab, 
we can get bit rates up to about a megabit per second now um, through the water column. And this is really exciting as we go and look for more challenging environments and how to access data without radio uh, from an underwater vehicle to something airborne or satellite borne. Um, this would be a system that could you know, simultaneously image things as well as provide a communication system. Uh, we've also been working on what do we do with all the data products from these instruments? You know, imaging islands at the centimeter scale produces data sets per island that is around 150 terabytes. You map a few islands, you're quickly up to the petabyte scale. And they're really 3D data sets that have um, so much in them, but you know, it's not really useful unless you can extract meaningful information about, in this case, the benthic habitat. So we developed an AI that works on the NASA supercomputer called NemoNet. And this developed into, um, first it was just a convolutional neural network for mapping corals. Um, and then it later grew into um, a citizen science video game that everyone contributes to and helps us get very high accuracy in mapping these systems by using these instruments. So I'll share this video now. What if you could help NASA create a map of the ocean floor with just the tip of your finger? The ocean, teeming with life. It defines our blue planet, drives our ecosystem, and regulates our climate. Coral reefs are one of the most diverse and important systems in the ocean. They're also becoming an important source of medicines for some of the world's deadliest diseases. But they are dying at unprecedented rates due to rising temperatures. But we don't know how much we're losing or how much our climate is changing. We can't until we determine how much healthy reef exists now. And the only way we can know that is with your help. NASA NemoNet is a game where you classify the world's coral reefs by painting on real-life images scanned from the ocean floor using a revolutionary instrument that lets us see beneath the waves at unprecedented resolutions. Our oceans are so vast, it would take us two million years to classify the world's coral reefs by hand. The classifications you create are sent to our teams of NASA scientists at home base to teach our supercomputer to classify coral reefs on a global scale. Every contribution you make brings us closer to solving this problem. Join the NASA team to help us understand these amazing ecosystems. Take command of your research vessel and learn about all the different types of coral. <laughs> we must keep the ocean alive. It supports our life as we know it. Together, we can create a global data set of coral reefs and build a better understanding of how to save these aquatic worlds, one piece of coral at a time. Good luck, and welcome to the NASA NemoNet team. So we launched NemoNet uh, last year during, on Earth Day. It was in development for about four years, and it just happened to coincide with the peak of a, a global pan viral pandemic. But within one month, you know, possibly because there were lots of folks sitting at home um, and idle students, we had more than 300 million people um, looking at this, and it really just got a huge user base. We made the prediction at the time, a lot of folks were asking us, why should we care about mapping coral in the midst of a viral pandemic? And we said, well, you know, a lot of next generation drugs come out of these ecosystems. Um, they're sessile, they've evolved powerful biological defenses over the years. And sure enough, just um, four months ago, um, UCS San Francisco announced a new drug 30 times more effective than remdesivir for treating COVID that was derived from a uh, marine reef, a sea squirt. So we felt a little bit vindicated. Um, just to show some of the reach of, of NemoNet, uh, we've been able to really tap into everywhere where people have access to technology and the internet. So it's not quite everywhere that we would like to. There's still a barrier of entry, but we're trying to make that easier uh, over time. Here you can see the different app downloads per country and users. And just to give you an idea of you know, how well people are performing, we train users in the game to, to go through tutorials, mandatory tutorials. They have to reach a certain accuracy before they're allowed to progress. And the result has been a very, very accurate um, training data set for NemoNet. So here you can look at uh, algae and a parietes coral heat map of just user classification. So these are inputs to the training model, not the outputs directly of our model, but they train it. And you can see that there's quite a, a good deal of convergence in something that we thought would be quite difficult for a lot of people to do. Um, in fact, the accuracy of these products you know, it peaks not with the PhD trained marine biologists, but with usually their kids, uh, people that are 10 to, to 15 years old, they're outperforming um, PhD trained biologists in accuracy in classifying these three environments. And it could be that they're just, you know, more savvy with technology or 
they you have just been exposed you know one one coral type at a time and so have a very good grasp of what it looks like but it's a, it's a really promising way to engage people um, and produce good science results so to justify you know the good science results um, here's an example of where we've taken um, data from nemonet this is using a fluid lensing imagery in a neighboring area and merged it with satellite products uh, for that region that already exists but do not have fluid lensing corrections and here you can see that the accuracy in predicting um, these 10 classes visible only by satellite increases when you switch from you know using something that's trained at the centimeter scale to not trained at the centimeter scale we right now have a, a total accuracy of about 84 85 percent um, across these large classes but that improves upon the state of the art by about 30 percent in accuracy um, so here you can see some of the, the follow-on work we're doing with NemoNet and some of the news articles. Um, one really exciting development is the habitat map products in NemoNet, which are going to come out late this year, uh, are being used directly by um, entities like the United Nations for sustainable development goal monitoring for ecosystem protection and being able to track these habitat changes on very fine temporal scales and spatial scales that can help um, member countries assess the quality of their environment and what actions they can take to protect them. And then recently we had a, a new proposal selected, um, a joint NASA NOAA project we're calling PicoGram that will inform uh, coral reef resilience-based management through the prediction of individual coral organismal growth, recruitment, and mortality. And what's exciting about this project is it, it takes a technology development from NASA and applies it directly to and it hands it over essentially to the logical custodian agency, which is NOAA, to take that data and actually um, implement policy changes and rewild a lot of coral systems intelligently. So using you know, information about um, that entire ecosystem, not just uh, the vent, the habitat map. So I'll see more about that uh, over time. If you're curious to learn more about the you know, in-depth workings of any of these technologies, uh, you can scan this QR code or take a look at some of these recent publications. Um, we put out a new one in Frontiers recently on the, the citizen science outputs itself of NemoNet. Uh, there's a lot of skepticism going in about the quality of and accuracy of that data product, but it turns out that it is a very effective way when done properly to produce you know, accurate habitat um, assessments in a very challenging environment where you know, corals have a biodiversity that's usually around 100 times that of the Amazon rainforest per square meter. So it's a very challenging AI problem. Um, and it really required a lot of training data. <laughs> so I encourage you to take a look at these if you have the time. And uh, I thank you so much for your time.